Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, happy 4th of July. Yeah, happy 4th of July, Ken, to you, your family, to Rob, to Sam, our man here who's taping everything always, Sam Rivera. To everybody, to all our fans out there, to all the people in this great country that, um, I don't know, I, 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 just speaking for myself, but I hope everyone appreciates this country and how great it is and uh, how fortunate they are to live here and how many people gave up what they gave up, the ultimate sacrifice to give us what they've given us and um, to have this this uh, kind of country. That's why so many people risk themselves to come here. Why do you think they're trying to come here? Because it's it's not a place you want to be. <laughs> no, it's because it's a place that's uh, that's special. So happy 4th of July to everybody and to show our love to all of you. If you don't already know it, uh, we've given up our barbecues, our hot dogs, our hamburgers, our ribs. Um, Ken has a special rib recipe. He, he, <laughs> he's putting that off. Uh, you know, he's got a, you know, you can imagine Ken with his barbecue, you know. <laughs> I'm going to uh, smoke uh, a brisket. I, I mean, forget about <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, he, he's got a whole bunch of chefs waiting on him. and We, we postponed all of that uh, to be with you guys because you guys are the priority. We want to bring you what you expect us to bring you, the news on the fights and this weekend's UFC card and whatever else was there. So here we are for you. Um even before the relish and the hot dogs and, and mustard and everything else, uh, we, we are with our people. And um, Rob, I want to say that Rob, Rob went to France. We appreciate him. He's, he's dealing with jet lag and all that stuff. And he still, you know, he, he still was able, with the help of Sam Rivera, was able to put my tweets up all the way from France. So you people that read those tweets, they were pretty special. They were they were they were being sent to France and then being sent back over here um, <laughs> by by Rob. And then, like I said, Sam Rivera was good enough to step in and help out a little bit. The last thing I want to say is that we also putting off. Well, actually, it comes on a little later, but we're putting off the Coney Island hot dog contest. Um, but you know what, Ken? I don't feel that bad about that one, even though it's in my hometown. You know, it's right here across the bridge in Brooklyn. Uh, and it's a tradition, obviously, of 4th of July and um, Nathan's Hot Dogs. But it, it's kind of like watching a Top Rank show or even a PBC <laughs> show where you know who's going to win. Yeah, yeah, You know what I mean? You know Joey yeah. Chestnuts is going to win. I mean, like, where's the drama? The only the only possible drama is does he beat his record? I believe I got it here. <laughs> 68 hot dogs plus the bun. Plus the bu I get sick talking about it. Like, even repeating it, I start to get nauseous. But 68 hot dogs, all the buns with it. And, um, uh, and probably he, a gallon he, of water after he gallon, dips the yeah, buns. because they soak the buns. That's the trick. They soak the buns in the water. So I, I don't know. That That's the only thing that's uh, that we don't know is does he break his own record. But other than that, you know, we, we kind of know, like we know these weekly fights uh, with some of these promoters that we kind of know who's going to win. You know what's funny about that, though, on a serious note? It's amazing what the human body can do. The human body is so much stronger than anything, including your mind. Your mind will always give out before your body. You see it all the time, even in fighting, right, where people are just like, I know I can keep going, but I'm just, I, the, the unknown is well, so intimidating to Well, that's why I always say 75% of the fight world is, is mental. Because it that's is, right. because, you know, the, the body is the soldiers, the mind is the general. And the general gives the orders. And if the general is together and he's he's in good shape, you know, and he's strong and he's what a general is supposed to be, then then the body's going to follow. But if the general's not, if he's not up to par, then the body's going to fail. So that's again, that's that's why you always hear me saying seventy five percent. And all the great fighters, they all know it. They all agree right away. Said, "Yep, seventy five percent, maybe eighty percent sometimes." Well, speaking of one-way fights and predictable fights, there was a fight last week while we were off that was anything but predictable on paper. It looked to be 
maybe even a little one-sided for the older veteran in Rungvise, but my God, did Jesse Bam Rodriguez show the world that what he's ready for at 22 years old, he stops the veteran Sarang Vise, the Thai fighter in the eighth round. He put on a master performance. And what I'm dying to know from you is, did we see Sarang Vise get old overnight? Or did Jesse Rodriguez just show the world that he's levels better than A, what people expected of him, and B, levels better than Rungvise in the, on, on this night because he looked great. Rungvise didn't look great, but I'm curious to know if you think, like I said, Rungvise just got old or he was just clearly outmatched. Well, that's, that's explained to the fans real quick, who don't know out there, of why you're bringing it up that way, which is the right way. You know, Rungvise was 50 wins, 6 losses, and 1 draw with 43 knockouts. So, uh, obviously, he's got a lot of miles on his odometer. And not just that, but he fought a lot of a lot of top, tremendous, tremendous fighters, and beat them, uh, beat, beat, beat a lot of them. Uh, he, he was a real warrior, a real gladiator, and a real fan favorite because, you know, he had that fan favorite pleasing style coming forward and banging and banging. Um, that style does obviously have a shelf life. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And like I said, and Teddy... The, Teddy, one quick thing that's worth noting at the weight of this guy, I think it was at was it one twelve or one fifteen? Usually you don't see guys like that with tremendous knockout power. This guy had fifty wins, forty three of them by knockout. That's an impressive stat for a guy that light. Yeah, no, that's what I had said. Forty three knockouts. And you know, um his style, I mean, you don't get knockouts, you know, moving around the ring and, you know, being a guy who's looking to survive or, you know, just, just looking to be, you know, show you how smart he is. Uh, he, he was a guy that did it one way, you know, come forward and, and get you and weigh you down. And he had a great chin. He had everything that an aggressive warrior type fighter with that style and with that longevity needed to have. But to your point, uh, there, you know, there was a time expiration on that kind of style, on on all styles, but especially that style. There's a reason why Mayweather is is still able to do what he does at the late age that he does it. He picks his spots with the guys that he's in there. Yeah, that's a big part of it too. But it, it's also because he's not a guy that has a lot of miles on his old dominant. He's not a guy that got used up uh, by having a walk-in style where you're more prone to getting used up uh, and getting shop one. You know, he was a defensive wizard. This guy was not. So that that's definitely that's definitely in the mix, Ken, and it's right of you to bring that up. But for me, it also was the style of Rodriguez. I, I think that 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 run uh, wrong visa, that wrong visa still would have been okay if he had a guy that stood in front of him, because that's what Rung Vizzi wants, that's what he looks for, especially now as he's older, you know, that, that he's getting to, to where he's getting to as far as age. He's 35 years old, by the way, 13 years older than Rodriguez was. So, and Teddy, one, one, one quick note yeah. on Rung Vizzi. First three fights, got knocked out twice and lost the, and, and, and had a draw. So he started out 0-2-1 with two knockout losses. Well, one of the greatest fighters of all time, my favorite, of, besides Sam Langford, he might be my, he's probably my favorite fighter of all time. And you guys should Google him that aren't familiar with him. And it's Henry Armstrong. And Henry Armstrong had 300 fights. He won three full weight division titles and defended them simultaneously. He was a monster. Nobody will ever do that. And when I say full weight division titles, I mean he won featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight title and then defended them simultaneously within a couple month period. And he fought for the middleweight title <laughs> and he got robbed against Severino Garcia. They made it a 15 round draw because he wouldn't do business with the fellas. And he, he wound up not getting the fourth full title, which he would have had. So he, I mean, you. and when he started, he, now so you just heard me, you know, talk about uh, obviously uh, his, his facts, his, you know, his resume. So you got to figure it would never touch on what Ken just mentioned about 
Ramvizi, uh, Ramvizi, same thing. When when this great great legendary fight, one of the greatest of all in this sport that's been around over two hundred years, one of the greatest fighters of all time, he started out getting knocked out in his first couple of fights, losing his first few fights. Um, very similar to what you just quoted as as the beginning record for Ram Fizzy. So what it tells us is that you lose and you learn. You, you sometimes you got to lose to win. Uh, it, it's not whether you win or lose at the beginning. It's what you take away from it, what you learn. That you don't give up. Obviously, that's that's the first part. And what you learn from it. And I, I just want to. It's a perfect learning moment. Uh, teaching moment for everybody out there that Ken brought that up. I, I just want people to let that resonate just for a second with you on the 4th of July, the special holiday, when the when we were big underdogs, big underdogs, uh, back in 1776. Uh, as, as big an underdog as you're ever going to see, and as big as fight that you're ever going to see, in, uh, ever, in the history of the world, where... This underdog called the United States of America that wasn't even that yet, that they go and they fight the Imperial Army, basically, the the the, the well equipped, powerful, you know, force of the English army, uh, with, with with all the weapons, with all the infantry, with all the teaching, with everything and, and we had a bunch of a bunch of uh, farmers, uh, farmers, uh, you know, renegades, just just farmers with pitchforks and <laughs> you know whatever. And, but slingshots, had, yeah, slingshots. But but they had heart. They had to determine, yep. determine. They had resolve. They had a cause. That's the big thing. They had a cause. Uh, there was an urgency. They were fighting for their freedom, uh, the greatest thing in this world to fight for. Uh, so again, when when just remember that that no matter what's happening in your life and you're losing, uh, and you're losing more than once, it's, you know what? Keep at it. Learn. Correct what's wrong. Correct what you, what, what you take away the lessons that, that this experience is meant to give you and make the corrections and keep on going and go back at it. And, and think about it when you're doing it and you feel lonely in that lonely universe. Like, oh no, you're not up to par. You're, you're, you're not winning. So you're, you're not meant for this. You're, you're not going to be what these, these great ones are that you want to be able to emulate or that you want to follow in their stride or you want to you know, make your own, uh, your, you want to make your own impression and, and you want to be something special the way other people have done. Remember that you're in good company. <laughs> Remember Henry Armstrong. Remember, you know, from R- Vesey, that these guys got knocked out early on and they went on to be great fighters. And like I said about Armstrong, he went on to be one of the greatest fighters of all time. So losing is not a dead sentence. Losing is, uh, does not in any w- way tag you for the rest of your life. No, what it does is it helps form you for the rest of your life. What it does is gives you an opportunity to overcome overcome something and get better that's what it does so i I just figured since you brought that up it was a good moment to do that and um and getting back to rum Vizzi, you know when you get older and you start to get a little shop worn the first thing that starts to go is the legs and and you and, and the chin a little bit where you the ability to endure is not quite the same in that way, even though the heart is still pounding the same way and you still want to get there. But closing the gaps, being being able to keep up with somebody quick, uh it, it it starts to be more of a strain when you get older. Now, if you have a guy at that age, he's 35 from Vizzy, that stands in front of you, you can still do what you do. You can. You could, and if Rodriguez stood in front of him, he might have found that out, but he didn't. Rodriguez's style had as much to do with the defeat of Ramvise as 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 any as the age did is what I'm saying in his own way, because by moving on him, he made him use those old legs. It, it created problems. It created gaps for him, and it created opportunities for. Rodriguez to do his thing, to counter punch, to use the ring, the pot shot, to keep more, to frustrate him too, to keep more balance, to make him miss, to create openings by making him miss. 
Uh, Rodriguez has that kind of style. He's very cute, as the old timers would say. Cute means he, he's real hard to hit. He's real slick, um, and he is. And and he did a masterful job of displaying the sweet science of boxing. Uh, this this great slugger, this 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 great champion, this tough tough guy. You know, he he just took him apart. He took him apart piece by piece, and. Um, uh, this, again, uh, he's going to have to style, or he has to style Rodriguez. I've given a lot of guys <laughs> fits. I mean, obviously, right now, I believe he's 16 and old, 22 years old. Ken, right? I believe he's 16 and old. And, Correct, yep. And I'll tell you, the first thing comes to my mind with that performance and how great it was how impressive it was, was you think about Inouye. Could he someday, the great Inouye, one of the pound for pound, he's probably in the top three right now, uh, from Japan. Could he be possibly a threat to Inouye um, in a, in a, sometime in the near future? He's not ready now. Because in a way, even though the style of Rodriguez is difficult, and it would be the right style to go with in a way, because you're not going to stand in front of this great puncher, or uh, this accurate puncher. You're not going to do that and beat in a way. But you're going to try to box. Uh, but you have to have something to also make him respect you and keep him honest. Right now, I don't think he's ready to fight this guy because in a way, he knows what to do with guys that move too. He'll cut the ring down. He'll use his jab to get in, to stabilize you on the outside, and he'll go to the body and take some air out of those radials, um, those tires. So he's not ready yet. But in the future, it could be very interesting. It, it makes me think, I love to quote the movies, all you guys know it, and it makes me think of that great, great movie, Ken, I'm sure it's on your favorite list of Gladiator with Russell Crowe, where, where there was a part towards the, about three quarters through towards the end a little bit, where Russell Crowe is the great Aurelius, Maxim Aurelius, uh, former general of, of the Roman Empire army, where he says to another gladiator, he says, uh, the, the other gladiator says to him, do you believe you're going to see your family who was murdered uh, by the regime uh, there and uh, by the guy who took over uh, as, uh, for Caesar? His son actually murdered his own father. And so he says to him, do you believe in the afterlife? Do you believe that you will meet up with your family again? And Maximum Aurelius you know, the, the the great warrior, Russell Crowe character, says, yes, I do believe I'm going to meet up with them in the afterlife, but not yet. <laughs> not yet. And that's kind of how I think of, you know, in a way, and Rodriguez. I think Rodriguez will meet up with him, and I think that he can give him a really interesting fight, but not yet. Not yet. So, um, but it's something to look forward to, Ken. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up that fight because we wouldn't have probably covered it. I'll, I'll be honest, if you hadn't brought it up. So, um, Teddy, one other thing to consider with Rodriguez is three years ago. So when he's 19, he was campaigning at Light Fly. So he was at 108 uh, three years ago, and I think this might have been. I'm just checking right now. Give me one second. I think this was his first fight at 115, and I think it might have been short notice. Um, and he also beat in his last fight Quadris, who's been around for a long time. Quadris, when they fought, had a record of 39 and four, and that was for a um, a vacant WBC Superfly title. So I mean, he's moved up a lot. So I think he probably needs a handful of fights. I would guess before he would step up again. You know, at those, at, as you know, at those lightweight classes, an extra three six pounds all of a sudden is a massive difference in terms of percentages of body the weight. The reason why so. I think it's possible. That, would, that I'm talking about, you're talking about him stepping up is because of his age and, and his body yeah, structure. Exactly. He's, got a, he's got a big enough body structure. But 
I, I think his age, because at 22, he hasn't completely filled out yet. You usually yeah. grow to you about 21. So um, I would I, I would say he's got a good chance. And with I that agree. style, he can he, he can give up weight, if you will, and move yep. up because he's, again, he's, you know, along the lines of a Mayweather in that kind of way that he's he's very responsible defensively. And he's a southpaw uh, on top of it. I don't know if I mentioned that. So uh, he, he's a handful. He, he's definitely a handful. He... Again, if I put a final, a final, um, a final stamp on it, I would say that the analogy that I've used in the past of a great pitcher, you know, disarming great hitters, would be him. He was like a great pitcher disarming a great hitter, you know, taking the bat out of his hands, you know, changing speeds, uh, changing, you know where the ball was coming over different parts of the plate, in and out, you know, mixing it up, keeping them off balance. I mean, he he did a, he he, he threw a shutout, and he did a masterful job. Yeah. Um, one, one other boxing match I want to talk about before we jump into the great UFC card from uh, Saturday night is there was a heavyweight fight on the zone middle of the day on Saturday. Wasn't well pu- publicized over here. I just happened to click on it um, in the middle of the afternoon. How come they never uh, Jim- publicized those fights? Ken, I, I mean, it's like looking for somebody in witness protection. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you can't find these fights. I mean, yeah. seriously, I'm, I, I mean... Uh, it's you have to be look you have to be a boxing like uh, a hardcore boxing fan and be looking for this stuff they're never going to get the casual fans to find them they're just not that they're just not publicized enough in mainstream but it is what it is so joe joyce fights christian hammer and i want to be careful in how i describe it because i never I, I i would never talk badly about someone i mean if the performance stinks the performance stinks but Joe Joyce knocks out Christian Hammer, and everyone's calling for him to fight Tyson Fury or one of these top guys. Let me just say, Christian Hammer, it looked like Christian Hammer got a week's notice to get ready for the fight by his conditioning. Even with that said, he still hit Joe Joyce with some overhand bombs, and Joe Joyce was a little sloppy with his technique, and and Hammer kept landing shots on him. To to Joyce's credit, he took the punches, but he was a, a better puncher. He ain't taking those punches, not from a heavyweight. And like I said, Christian Hammer, by by the end of the fight, when he finally got stopped, it looked like he was just exhausted from standing up that long. He, it was not good. It was not a good look for anyone, including Joe Joyce. He did what, what, what was expected of him. But to be calling for a top five, even 10 fighter, Joe Joyce, and again, no disrespect, but I can't imagine him lasting more than a few rounds with, I mean, certainly not Tyson Fury, but... Maybe maybe he'd do okay with a Joseph Parker or e- even some one of the young prospects. I don't I don't know. It just wasn't a good look for heavyweight boxing. It's not not a lot of depth there. Um, but a lot of people were asking if we were going to talk about it. And I know you didn't see it, but I know you know the, of the guys. So curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Well, first of all, you mentioned Parker. I think Parker's improved a lot. <laughs> I like Parker. I think Parker would would take him. Um, so I, I agree, but that, that would be more realistic for him to call for Parker than Tyson Fury. I mean, at that point, just say, hey, I want as much money as I can get to get knocked out because that's all that's going to happen. Yeah, no, if you're going to, listen, if you're vulnerable in that kind of way that you're pointing out, and he is, uh, you might as well, you know, go for the, for as they say, the big enchilada, right? You might as well yep. go for the, the money, the dough, the whole thing. If you're going to lose, and there's a good chance you're going to lose, lose for the for the money. Um, yeah, and that's management, uh, you know that that has to think of those things. But uh, as far as Joyce, first of all, people should know he's an Olympic silver medalist, and he, he's a big, tough guy. There's no doubt about that. He, he he takes a good shot, and he has to take a good shot because, as you said, is lacking of uh, technique in certain areas, especially defense. So, <laughs> and. And he's a good punch. He's a heavy-handed puncher. He's not a snappy puncher, but you know he's a he's more of a clubbing, uh, heavy-handed puncher, and he can wear you down uh, because he'll keep coming at you. Uh, he's slow. He's predictable. He's one-dimensional. Uh, his feet aren't fast. So obviously, him and Tyson Fury, it, it just it, it doesn't seem you know practical. The only thing that's practical about it is they're both from uh, across the pond. Well. Uh, obviously, Tyson Fury is. Joyce is really 
I, I think he trains in London or in England. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where he, where he originally is, you know, where he comes from, where he was born. But um, I, I know that uh, I'm pretty sure that he does his training. You could verify that. Rob could verify that for the people. But I think he does it over in, over in England. But either way, there's, there's more of an interest over there than there ever would be over here, obviously. Even though Fury, we understand, as, um, you know, is known everywhere. We understand that uh, throughout the whole world. But to fight somebody like Joyce, there'd only be interest, I would think, over there. Look, they put 90-something thousand people in in Wembley to see, to see Fury um, with... Uh, who was it? His last fight uh, that that he stopped. Um, it, it wound up being a non-competitive fight. Um, well, Dillian White. I mean, if you could oh, put yeah, 90, sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. But if you could put ninety thousand something plus people in a stadium with Fury to fight Dillian White, you know what? They put some people in there to see Joyce too. So let's not forget the economic part of it. And a hundred percent, you know. And and listen, I'm again the people thinking I'm taking a shot at them, and they know I love them, the uh, our beautiful brothers and sisters over across the pond. But you know, you guys, all you got is snooker and darts, and so <laughs> you know, so it's easier to get the people chomping at the bed for for a fight that it doesn't have to be you know Mike Tyson and you know uh, and and. Joe Lewis, you know what I mean? I, I, it's it's a little easier to do it over there. I know I know you got soccer, that's the universal sport, but come on, guys, really. And I know that you got the the good golfers with the kilts, right? They were, were the they kilts. got the best they got the best Formula One driver in the world, Hamilton Lewis, yeah, Lewis yeah. Hamilton. Yeah, you got that too. I mean, if he got in the ring, they'd come out to see him too. Um, but I, I I get everything you're saying uh, that. That's my take on it. Uh, like I said, uh, with Fury and Joyce, uh, hey, listen, we don't know if Fury's going to fight, but if he fights again, uh, you run out of opponents, you know, marketable opponents. You have to have somebody, and he'd probably fit right in, let's be honest. So, uh, but supposedly he retired, and he's looking to do the extravaganza, the event, the, the, the big, 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 big money maker uh like they did with uh, the crossover fight with mayweather and of course with mcgregor where it brought in all kinds of astronomical numbers they're looking to fight in ganyu um uh you know if i would think if he's gonna uh still fight after renouncing his retirement fury would fight in ganyu and try to bring in 150 million each uh, for them, I know that sounds crazy, but hey, McGregor made about 120 million, and I believe if my math is right and I'm reporting it right, I believe Mayweather made close to 300 million, somewhere maybe 280, couple uh, shillings shy, as our brothers and sisters would say over there, um, of 300 million. But uh, listen, it's a lot of money, and so if he continues. Fighting boxers, not just UFC champions, um, you'll probably, you know, you'll probably wind up seeing that fight. I, I, mean, I, I, I'd venture to guess that for the thirty to fifty million, which is probably what Fury gets to fight um, Joe Joyce, he takes that. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they made that fight before the end of the year in Wembley or in some big stadium over there, because you know they could sell it out. It would do really well over there, but it would be a one-sided massacre. Yeah, I mean, he's too available. He's too available, too easy to hit. In other words, uh, in the way that we speak in boxing, when you're available, you're easy to hit. And uh, you would think that, you know, he'd have as easy a time as he did with Dillian White. I mean, I don't think a lot of people thought it would be as easy as it was with Dillian White. He came so unprepared, so unprepared. It's like he didn't understand what he was fighting. I mean, really, it was shocking. It was like, yeah. like Dillian White got in there. He had no idea what to do, no preparation of what to do. Go lose. I, I don't care. But show that you were prepared for what you were dealing with, that you knew what you were dealing with. It's like he had no idea of the style and the abilities and the weapons that he was going to have to deal with 
that Fury brought to the table. I mean, it was, it was. I tell you, it was for me. It was. I was scratching my head, like, how do you come in here? You know, it's it's like going to do your a big test that's going to get you that big job. It's going to get you into the college you dreamed about being your whole life, your whole life, and you can't answer one question because you didn't study. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, that actually, as you're describing it, it reminds me of what Christian Hammer did in that fight. It looked like he had zero conditioning. I'm telling you, by like the third or fourth round, he could barely stand up. He was take, he was getting hit with shots. Don't get me wrong, but it looked like he was so exhausted. He was just like t- taking knees to take the count. Did just he to take, take it on break. quick notice, Ken? Because. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I didn't see the fight, and I wasn't even unless aware. it was twenty unless it was twenty four hours notice. The conditioning was so bad it was unacceptable. Yeah, You're a professional fighter; that's what you do for money. You should be able to at least be move around for twelve rounds no, or ten I, rounds. I I I I, I agree. Um, well, speaking of uh, speaking of Engano, I loved seeing Engano and. Um, uh, Kamara Usman, uh, Kamara Usman, come into the UFC dressed in. Uh, well, Ngannou was in traditional African garb, and um, and Kamara was in like uh, some kind of Niger- like green for Nigeria color shorts and a and a and like a, a sleeveless jacket unzipped with no shirt underneath. I just thought they looked cool. I thought they represented Africa well. I loved seeing. When it. I built, loved the pride. When you're built, when you're built like those, when you're built like <laughs> exactly. a Ganyu, you can wear something mm. unzipped. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, and Ganu and Ganu had on the full African garb, oh, and Camaro, okay. who looks like a friggin' Greek statue, well, that's he had on the sleeveless jacket. You can wear, then, you can wear that when you, and you could wear it too because you know you're in that league. <laughs> I love seeing those. I love seeing the three-headed monster from Africa. I love seeing them um, uh, show up for each other and support each other. To me, it's like the kind of pride that everyone should have in where they're from. Every time I see them, I make my daughter, she she gets so angry at me. I'm like, Tensei, come in here and look at these guys. Look how proud they are of themselves. I said, that's how you carry yourself. That's the kind of pride you have in who you are and where you're from. They just... They're just doing it. I love seeing it. The UFC should be promoting this in Africa like it's going out of style. But anyway, let's jump into the UFC card. There was some awesome action. Um, well, not all of it awesome. Let's start with the low light. Uh, Pedro Munoz and Sean O'Malley. Um, wait, wait, wait. Let me no- just correct sure. one thing that you just said there because you're a little bit off. Um, it, was, it was proposed. It was put forward. It was set up as a tremendous great great fight card no doubt no getting around that uh, it was set up that way as a great night of ufc fighting it was and usually when it is with this sport with them with dana white it it comes true this one didn't live up to the marquee it didn't live up to the billing to to what we thought it would be only one fight quite frankly lived up to that and that one only went two rounds. I believe it went two rounds. And that was the uh, that was the Lola, <coughs> excuse me, Lola and Barbarina fight. And we'll get to that in due time. But the rest of them, Ken, you'd have to agree because we always tell the truth here. Um, we're disappointing as far as the the action, the theater of what was expected to be. Now again. The matchups, there was nothing wrong with it. They were matchups that were supposed to be what they, we thought they were going to be. Just a sensational night of great one after great one. Like like the UFC had at Madison Square Garden back six, seven months ago with, with that show. Usman was, was the headliner uh, on, that, on that show. And, and that was an unbelievable show. Um, but this one didn't live up to the billing. It just, it happens. It happens. It, it didn't quite live up to it. But it still had interesting things that we can break down and we will break down because the expectation was very high. Uh, which it deserved to be, but um, go ahead. I, no, I, 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 I agree with you. Not a lot of uh, blood and guts and like drag out brawls, but a lot of uh, good learnings and observations. And there's so much to discuss here. But yeah, you're you're right. They, it, it didn't end up being a barn burner we were hoping for, and it was International Fight Week, essentially the Super Bowl for the UFC. This is this always traditionally their biggest show that they put on. Stacked card. The matchups were great. Uh, we're not going to talk about it, but Cowboy Cerrone retires, you know, 
clearly much more focused on his movie career. He uh, just filmed a huge movie with Gina Carano that was produced by Ben Shapiro and um, the conservative group that he runs called Terror on the Prairie. Um, so he's clearly focused more on that. But anyway, he, sad he, to see. he deserves to be tired. We wish him all the luck in the world because he. you just used the term. I'm going to piggyback off it. He's built his guts and blood in the ring so many times in the octagon so many, so many. And... It was time to retire. He was shop one. He was a guy with a lot of miles on old dominant that I always talk about. And it was time for him to go out um, because of his style. Because he had a fan-friendly style. And, and where that meant, what does that mean? That usually doesn't mean that you're the slickest guy in the world, right? That you're yep. a cutie. And a cutie pie, as the old times would say. <laughs> real slick in that ring. And you can't hit him in the backside with a handful of buckshot if he stands in front of you. No, that's not... Not the style of a fan friendly guy usually and it wasn't the style obviously of Cerrone so um so he so go forward go into the sunset enjoy it you were tremendous you gave everybody uh tremendous action theater uh you taught people too like a lot of the great ufc fighters that i talk about all the time you taught us how to behave that that is our choice how we behave when we're in a tough position you always behave like a warrior like a gladiator and best of luck to you cowboy and the and the universe has rewarded him with a career in movies he's been in a ton already and he's starring in movies and uh what a what a life that guy's lived and he's earned every everything that he's received so good luck good luck to donald and um all right let's get into the main card uh pedro munoz and sean o'malley i know it ends in a no contest in a um via uh via a method that i know frustrates you greatly if i poke gets his eye poked and to be honest with you you could kind of see i don't know I, you never want to question a fighter's uh decision or what's going on but you know and i know and everyone knows the minute you say i can't see to the doctor the fight is over so and there's a guy and there are guys out there like diaz brothers cowboy cerrone where if their eye was on the canvas outside they tell you they could still see uh uh, uh what's his name michael bisman he'd fight with a half an eye there's no way he would ever say I well, can't see. Well, he actually see. did fight with a half an eye. Exactly. Oh, oh, with one so, eye. The, the strange thing is I thought the, the first round was okay, a little competitive, relatively close, but in the second I felt the tide turn and O'Malley was starting to turn it on, and as soon as that eye poke happened, I almost feel like you never want to question a fighter's heart or integrity, but I felt like... Especially these guys. Especially these yeah, guys. Yeah, but, you know, they asked him, can you see? He said, I can't see in the end. No contest there. How'd you like that one well, while it lasted? Well, well first of all, he, he said that it was the second eye poke that he received in the fight. And, and just before that, he, he also got hit a low kick. Um, so he was... Some stuff was, was coming at him. He had some bad weather that he was dealing with uh, there. And listen, in all fairness, I get what you're saying, and I do. I, I really do. But in all fairness, um, and I'm the first to jump on that wagon with you a lot of times, a lot of times. Uh, I don't know about this one because this is a guy that never capitulated before in his career. This is a guy that you know has has a lot of fights. He's a veteran guy. Um, he's been down. A, he's been you know. He's been he's been on the tracks. You know he's been he's been in the tough part of town uh, before. And and he's he's never taken that route uh, before when he's been in difficult situations before. Uh, it turns out now I don't know. I never again. Uh, I never report something if I'm not a hundred percent sure of its authenticity, its accuracy. So I'll leave it up to Rob to to do the checking. That's part of what he does with us uh, when he's producing these shows. He'll do the checking. You do the checking. You guys actually know how to work computers. You know what I mean? I only know how to say computer. Computer. I can't actually work a computer, but you guys can actually do that, and you can find uh, information at your fingertips. I believe that he had said he got a report from the doctor, he being Munoz, that said that the cornea was completely scratched, you know, from the eye poke. So, okay, uh, if that helps us out there and helps people out there, you know, dealing, you know, with that he couldn't go on. He, he also said, and that, again, he went to a doctor. I didn't see the report, but he went to a doctor. I'm taking him for his word. Um, and he said that... If, 
completely scratched cornea and that he couldn't see, could not see out of that eye for 20 minutes. And, and again, you could go back in boxing to your point where Carmen Basilio, the great welterweight champ, you know, from many years ago, what a tough, tough guy, uh, fought all the great fighters like Sugar Ray Robinson. And he once fought Sugar Ray Robinson, the great, some people think the greatest fighter pound for pound in the history of boxing. And he fought him with one eye closed. He looked like a cyclops. I mean, his eye was that swollen, that closed, and he fought a big part of it, 15 rounds with one eye. Matter of fact, i never forget his quote. Back in those days, boxing was the biggest sport in the country, bigger than baseball. So you had all the press, <coughs> all the journalists were there. And I'll never forget, right after the fight, one of the journalists offered him a half an excuse, whatever you want to call it, but, but it was an observation, an honest observation. He said, Carmen, uh, wouldn't you have, uh, did the one eye have something to do with you losing, the, with, that you only had one eye? Did that have something to do with you getting beat? And, and Carmen, without even flinching, said, what's that got to do with anything? My other eye was fine. <laughs> I mean, that's the breed. That's, that's the breed of men. And, and you got yeah. that breed today, too, with, with certain guys. Not everyone, but with certain guys in UFC, for sure. For sure. Anthony Smith, all those guys. All of them. Biz Bang. I, I mean, the list would be too long, uh, you know, to, to go on. These special, special uh, gladiators uh, that, that define the word. Define the word gladiator by their behavior in that octagon. So, again... I, I don't know. All, all I know is we're covering every part of it the best we can. And I know that I was looking forward to see this, to see if this rising star O'Malley, uh, who, who's on the same curve, a little bit of like a McGregor, where, you know, he's, he's becoming that star, you know, <laughs> um, his style, his... his uh, his little his flamboyance i mean you know looks like he has the package you know his athleticism uh you know how sensational he can be in that ring at times or in that octagon at times and so i was looking forward to seeing if he got tested or would be tested by munoz who i thought could test him uh you know with his experience and 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 whatnot and and the first round was interesting because it was a boring round. I'm the first to say it. <laughs> but it was a tactical round. It was like they were both playing chess, but, you know, they were being they were being very, very careful. And, like, nobody wanted to move their rook because they felt that it might get taken off the table. So they were being really cautious. And they were both looking for counter opportunities so they were looking not to give the other one what uh that opportunity and so they were controlling range using their legs feints a lot of posturing a lot of positioning a lot of feeling out if you will uh, a lot of sparring if you will and so when the first round got finished uh again no no barn burner you used the term earlier ken no barn it wasn't even a campfire you know, with, with, with a couple of marshmallows. But when it was over, I felt Munoz won the round. And I thought it was very interesting. I said, okay, let's see things warm up now because it's only a three-round fight and the star, the guy who's supposed to win here, who's being showcased, right? O'Malley, he, he's, he's in danger a little bit because you're down one round in a three-round fight. Hey, you got to get going. And he didn't show really any ability to figure out Munoz in the first round. So I was interested to see, is he figuring him out now? Is he going to figure him out? Is he going to be forced to take more risks now, being that he's behind or potentially behind one round to nothing and there's only three rounds? There started to be some drama even there for me, even in a fight that hadn't shown any drama yet. So I was really, and I'm wondering if the people, our fans out there, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters out there, if, if they're with me on this, I, I was really curious to see how O'Malley was going to conduct himself, see how he was going to behave, see what he was going to come up with, and then what happens? 
the eye poke, and and it's all over, and and it's done, and it was disappointing, and to me, to everyone, I'm sure, but to me in that way, and I sent the tweet out that I've sent out before, and I've talked about this on this show before, Ken, that when, with all the science and technology that's available out there, when is the UFC going to get somebody, some inventor, some scientist, somebody to invent a glove, uh, a sort of, you know, a, a sort of foam-like material, web material, if you will, that bonds all the fingers together, yet is still pliable enough to go to the mat and grapple. When is someone going to come up with that? Because it's a problem. It's a problem in this sport. I know these are monsters. I know they're savages. I know they deal with everything. I get it. Uh, elbows, knees, kicks. My God. But... Eye pokes, it's, it's, it's a different thing. And it is it has created a problem in the sport. It doesn't happen, you know, once every millennium, or once every Haley's Comet. It happens a lot. So I'm just curious of your thoughts on that too and the fans' thoughts on that, Ken. When, that, that was the first thing that hit me when I was disappointed. Then I went right away, I said, when are they going to come up with a way to... Get rid of these eye pokes. I think Trevor Whitman's working on a glove that has that has some mechanisms like what you describe. And Trevor Whitman, the um, great coach, um, striking MMA coach. coach. Yes, yeah, yes. exactly. I think he has a glove that's trying to solve that problem, but it's clearly a problem that is uh, complex. That it will allow you to um, be able to grapple and still not get the fingers loose there. But yeah, that was a disappointing end to that fight, I'm sure, for both guys. And Pedro Munoz, I think, was like th uh, one in three coming into that fight. So it was a fight he needed to win. And uh, I'm sure disappointing for him and O'Malley looking to um, get back on a winning streak here. Um, but one thing that you can do to protect your uh, not only your eye health, but your overall health is take your athletic greens every day, Teddy. One thing that people ask me all the time about my own running and my own athletic performance is if you could only take one supplement, what would it be? And it would definitely be athletic greens because athletic greens has 75 whole food source ingredients. I make sure that I get fruits and vegetables all day, every day. But when I'm traveling, when I'm busy, when I'm dealing with the kids, Athletic Greens is like my insurance policy to make sure if nothing else, regardless of anything else I eat, that I'm getting all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that I need with Athletic Greens. I put one scoop into the shaker bottle. It comes with eight ounces of water. Shake it up. Boom. Tastes great. Down it goes. Easy peasy. If you like the show and you, want, and you like your own health, Consider getting a subscription to Athletic Greens for a few months. See if it improves your overall performance and health. Help yourself. Help the show. Athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code ATLAS. Athleticgreens.com. Use promo code ATLAS at checkout, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first with your first purchase. Those travel packs are invaluable. I take them everywhere, as I've said over and over again. With that being said, Teddy, let's get into the second fight on the main card. And that one was the best of the night. Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler, Brian Barberina, a freaking war. I mean, at times I was watching it and I was thinking I was watching a bar fight. Just two guys in a face punching contest. Little to no defense. Just thudding shots. It was literally like you could hear the like fist hitting the face on every shot where you like... You know when you see a fight in the street and two guys who can clearly fight are going at it, and you're like, whoa, these guys, someone's going to get hurt. These guys are throwing shots. That's what it reminds me of. I'm like, man, someone's going to get hurt here. And it, the tide was going back and forth. I thought Lawler was, Barbarina was clearly the busier, but Lawler clearly had more on his shots and he was picking them. And when he opened up, he was hitting bombs. And finally, though, the tide, like you would say, slowly just started to wash the sand away and got to Lawler's sand castle and just washed it out to, to the ocean. And he couldn't stop the tide coming. And uh, referee jumped in right at the right time. Lawler was just about to go down. And whew, what a fight. How'd you like it? Well, first of all, the a tremendous description of it. First of all, that sandcastle, which happened to be named Lola, was 40 years old. Let's yep. not forget that. That's of extraordinary. Course. That's extraordinary. 
Ah, oh, these people are extraordinary. These men, these women, they are extraordinary. So uh, I can't overstate that. And he, I tweeted about that, about the things that you just touched on. And to your point, Bob Arena was the busier guy. You know, he was winning a contest of punch stats, if you will. Uh, you know, a number of punches, accumulation of punches. Uh, but what Lola won the first round uh, for me, close, uh, they were, it was all tight. But for me was what you touched on, that not only was he landing the harder punches, which is significant, because in boxing and also MMA, part of the protocol part of you know the judging protocol is that who lands the cleaner more effective punches you know is winning the fight to a certain extent so that for me he was landing the harder shots while Barbarina was throwing more of them but there was one other part he was placing his shots early on while Barbarina was just throwing Barbarina was throwing but Lola was placing that's a big difference and to me that that that's what had him a little bit in the lead and a little bit in the lead in the, in the last round, the last round, the second round, uh, early on. But then, as you said, the tide, the tide changed, and what what changed it was he could. Barbarina started placing those shots a little better. You know, he was still keeping up the numbers, but now he was being more accurate, if you will. But just being more deliberate a little bit in his placement of the shots. And that obviously is a, it's one thing to throw, it's another thing to throw accurately. And um, he started doing more of that. Uh, I, it, was, it was back and forth. It had all the earmarks that a great fight have to have, you know, back and forth. Guys taking different turns. You described it at the beginning about, you know, just a slug fest, just two guys hitting each other in the face. You know, it made me think about the great Mickey Duffs uh, saying one of the great boxing guys, and from across the pond, by the way, one of the great boxing promoters, great boxing minds of all time. He used to say to me, Teddy, these two fellas get insulted if you miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know I, I i mean that's what it was like you know and and um it was uh, again it had all the drama it had everything uh just tremendous um it, it was just once he hurt i thought that in the second round that for a second there i thought i wonder if bob arena missed his moment he hurt lola and he he didn't finish him, and I thought he should have been going to the body. And if he went to the body, because Lawler was still showing his experience at forty, doing a pretty good job of slipping a little bit, moving, trying to you know, obviously not get tagged with all those punches, and he was moving his head a little bit, avoiding some of them. I just thought, wow, if I'm Barbarina, I'm going to the body here because that. Yep. That That's free, what I thought too. That have freeze the head movement, and then he'll be able to find them up top and get rid of them. Maybe he's blowing it a little bit here, but then he didn't blow it because he 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 hurt him again, and then he stayed on him, and he had the advantage of hand speed too, and he stayed on him, and the barrage it was a rainstorm, and and. Lawler just didn't have an umbrella. He had, and he had nowhere to, to get cover. And he just now, he still didn't go the body, but they were more concise, the punches. By the as, way, Teddy, when I he said. was doing that, how did you like the poker face or the job of playing possum for Lawler? I mean, I couldn't tell if he was hurt or not. When he, even when they stopped him, I'm like, his facial expression is the same as when he was landing, as when he's getting hit. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. tell. Well, he's a stoic guy. He's the real deal. You know, those guys, when they're the real deal, that's what you see. Uh, and, and that's what you saw with him. And again, he didn't switch the body, but this time his punches were placed a little more accurately. And he, again, it was just a deluge. Uh, it, it was a tropical rainforest. <laughs> I mean, it, it just didn't stop. 
and yeah. and he finally got through to the point he didn't give him a chance. He just didn't give the man a chance to get out of the rain. I mean, that's yep. the best way I can say it. And and to your point, the referee did a hell of a job stopping it because he was gone. He was gone, and um, he he did a perfect timing of his job you know the referee we forget sometimes they're supposed to be expert at their job too it's so important and the judges and sometimes they're not only the fighters are expert at their jobs but in this case also the referee matched the expertise of the fighters and he was he was very good at his job and he got it done right uh great great couple rounds unbelievable really yeah, that was a fun one. Side note, I uh, saw our friend Dustin Poirier was at the fight and got into a heated exchange with uh, Nashville native um, or Nashville resident Michael Chandler. You know, Dustin, I think, was upset that after Chandler's last fight, he called out everyone except Dustin. So it looked like from the cell phone video I saw, who I think I think Gilbert Burns posted it, their team, him, his teammates with Poirier. Uh, this is ringside at the UFC. I hear it, Dustin yelling at him, yeah, you say everyone except me. I'm going to F you up. And they were in. Into, they were into it. Security came over. So just an interesting side note. I know Dustin's chomping at the bit for a fight. He can't seem to get booked. I know it. I mean, I think a month or two ago, he went down to Florida to start, you know, kind of getting ramped up for a training camp, and he still doesn't have anything booked. So it looks like him and Chandler might have made their own uh, next opponent at the uh, at, at International Fight Week. So it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. But let's keep going. You know, with that's the, interesting uh, because Poirier, if you guys missed it, and the last time he was on our show, he's been on quite a few times uh in the interview we talked about that you know head yeah. on we talked about yeah. it. his the the one <laughs> the one name that didn't come out of chandler's mouth uh that night when he had that great win uh was obviously uh poirier's name so uh it's funny he followed up on it you knew he would because he's a prideful he, you know he's what what great champions are they're prideful they're stubborn <laughs> and, yeah. you know and they're gonna they're going to follow up on what they believe in and what they need to follow up. One last thing about Barbarina. Uh, I, when he heard him the final time and then he, you know, he put it on him with that barrage of punches, I believe it was a right hook um, that started it. And the reason I bring that up is from the southpaw position, that right hook, and, and look, from the orthodox position too, the hook can be so dangerous because... You need your peripheral vision to pick it up. <clears throat> and you're not really used to seeing the punches come sometimes from that angle. And sometimes you're focused on them coming down the middle, and all of a sudden they come from the side, and your peripheral doesn't quite pick them up. I didn't think his peripheral picked up this little short right hook that started his downfall. And then, of course, like I said, it was, you know, forget about it. The floodgates would... The floodgates were just opened. So. Yep. Well, speaking of hooks, that brings us to the third fight with. Um, yeah, it does. Alec. Nice way to segue, isn't it, Ken? Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Alex Perea, uh, who has, I believe, two wins over Izzy and at least one knockout, maybe two in a, um, in kickboxing. He was in with the uh, incredibly tough Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland fan favorite. He's out there. He's a super nice guy, but man, he's he's pretty good on the mic. Anyway, he was. Uh, they were getting into it a little bit before the fight, and um, you know, as they do at the press conferences, and Strickland was like, "Ah, oh, he's a big puncher, big deal. I train with big punchers. I'm not worried about him. He better worry about me." And and he just stood straight up, stood right in front of Pereira. It took him two, two plus minutes, but eventually he found his chin, found Strickland's chin and just starched him. Hit him with a beautiful hook, sent him down, and then followed up instantly and placed another bomb right on his chin. And uh, that was all she wrote for Strickland. Um, big win. Looks like it sets up a potential um, matchup with Adesanya and Pereira if uh, all goes according to plan which will make interesting uh, storyline given that he has two wins over Izzy in kickboxing and uh, at least one knockout how'd you like that fight yeah you know again it turned out to be not disappointing in the performance of Pereira obviously and it was sensational so people are still satisfied you get a sensational knockout even if it's in one round people love that um, you know, even though uh, they expected more of Mike Tyson and Michael Spinks way back in the day, and it was only 90 seconds, but 
It was sensational knockout. So people still said, wow, I witnessed, you know, I witnessed something that's still worth seeing, worth, you know, even though it was not, you know, a, a lot of time, uh, longevity to it, but uh, it was explosive. And this was explosive. So in that way, I guess people were satisfied. But again, a lot of people thought, that this fight would have a chance to be more competitive. Uh, there are handicappers that said Pereira might be too experienced, uh, that Strickland might not be ready, that Pereira, with his skill sets, might be uh, a danger uh, matchup for Strickland. And, and they sure as hell were right. Um, <laughs> the the I'd thing say. that. Yeah. The thing that I, I want to piggyback off what you touched on, I had seen, I saw what you talked about with, before the fight with the talk, and you know, that's promotional stuff. They're all trying to promote themselves and, and be, you know get that it factor uh, to make more money where people want to come and see him. The way McGregor did a great job of promoting him, and he backed it up. He backed it up with his skills and with his will and everything else during those early years that he was building himself up. Um, but he was a masterful, like Muhammad Ali, Mayweather was good, a uh, masterful promoter. And Strickland was doing some of that. But I saw another interview before the fight where I thought it was a tip-off, a little bit. Because I all, we talked about early in this show, Ken, I always talk about 75% of this business being mental. And to that point, in the interview I heard him with somebody, um, the the. The interviewer was saying that you're, a lot of people say that you're in a real danger fight here. That, uh, you know, with Pereira, the kickbox, he knocked out, as you said, Adesanya, but they had gloves on uh, in kickboxing. But just his skill sets that this, this is the kind of fight where, and I think the handicappers were right, where y you like to strike. You like to be in front of the guy doing that. But for this one, you might have to take Pereira to the mat and, and use some skills down there, grappling, whatever, uh, down on the mat uh, to nullify his advantage maybe in the striking world. And, you know, and again, the interviewer was bringing up the fact of how a lot of people thought he was going to lose his fight. And all of a sudden he says, and again, you can spin this a lot of ways or take this a lot of ways where, you know, he's a good talker, Strickland. Uh, he's a good promoter. And, you know, he's just and or he's just saying different things or that there was a tinge of truth, a tinge of doubt, because we all have doubt. We don't show it, but we all have it. And we wouldn't be normal if we didn't have that. And he... You know, a little bit, a little fear if you want, because you got to be ready for what's dangerous. Otherwise, you wouldn't be ready for it. But then you got to control it. You got to have the confidence. You got to have the discipline. I get it. But this was definitely a step up for him. He knew it. And in this interview, he suddenly said to the interviewer, Hey, maybe he knocks me out. You know, maybe he's too good for me. Maybe. He's right. And again, they talk that way. They maybe. And maybe he's just being very candid in a way that he understands the business he's in. They all do. How dangerous he is, it is. And how on any given night anybody could get knocked out. I mean, he, under, you know, he understands that. You know, the same way as those great circus acts um, used to walk across that tightrope so many, so many feet up there and, and did it without a safety net. They knew the danger that one day that maybe a gust of wind comes out of nowhere and there's a chance they fall and <laughs> they don't, you know, they don't survive. I mean, they understand the dangers of their vocation. That's what I'm trying to say. And so maybe he was just, maybe he was just airing that out, if you will, about, yeah, uh, that could happen. But the way he said it, yeah, maybe this guy is too much for me. Maybe this guy is going to blow me out. Whatever. I, When he said that, I just thought to myself, from my perspective, I don't know if he's in the right place. I don't know if it means something. We're going to find out. And I still don't know because he just got caught. I don't know. But I do know 
that he fought the wrong kind of fight, I thought. That I thought the handicappers were right. That he probably should have tried to get to his legs, <laughs> uh, shoot in, and get him to the mat to nullify his advantage striking. And he stood in front of him. And I also know from my perspective that, and my experience, that he was standing in the pocket too much. I, he was, I watched him with my son, Teddy. He came home from Vegas with his family. He was so happy. He's here with us for a week, him and his son. And so we, we got everybody together. And he had flown home from Vegas with, that night. So we watched it together. And as we're watching it, my son, who's been watching boxing since he's a baby, says, Dad, is he standing in the pocket too much? And I said, yeah, he is. And he stood right in that striking zone of Pereira. And he's standing in front of him. And then there was one other part. And it's a big part. Pereira is one of these guys from a physical standpoint that has really long arms. And it's hard to judge his striking zone, where it ends. It's hard to judge that because they're longer than most fighters' arms. So I thought to myself, I don't know if this guy's prepared for this, what he needs to be prepared for. He's standing right in that striking zone. And I don't know if he understands where that striking zone extends to because Pereira has an uh, extension longer than most. And... All of a sudden, bang, it's over. And it's over because he never saw the punch coming. That's what happens when you don't see a punch coming. The lights get turned out. You don't have time to register to prepare in your brain to, to <laughs> button down the hatches and get ready. It's, you're gone. If you see it, you can handle it maybe, but not when you don't see it. And it was a perfect punch because if you really look at it, the arms of Strickland started to go up, and in some way, it blocked the view. The hook came at a perfect, just a perfect level, or not a perfect level for him. <laughs> not a perfect level for Strickland, but a perfect level for the deliverer of the punch, where it just kind of, it was like one of those stealth bombers that disappear in the sky and you can't see them, where it the, it just, the punch got cloaked, got got invisible almost, where it got hidden, where the passage of the punch was hidden in the clouds, in the arms, and he never he never was able to pick it up, and again I think it was he wasn't ready for the punch to come to that length, to come that long, and I tweeted this that a lot of times you see tall guys, and this is unique, you see tall guys use their length with the jab. That's pretty common. They're supposed to do that. You very rarely see a tall guy use their hook with their length, and he used the hook with his length. That was, that was really special, where he threw not a long jab, but a long hook. He extended that hook the way you normally see Tall and wiry guys extend their jab. And that that's what gave him the results. And it's the same punch that knocked out Izzy. You know, not the same exact delivery of it, because I thought I think when Izzy got knocked out, he had thrown a right hand, and behind the right hand he finished with a hook. And and Izzy never saw the hook coming. He only saw the right hand. So it was a little different. The delivery was a little different. The trickery, if you will, was a little different that was used there. But again, it was the same punch. It was the same effect. Uh, it was devastating. And I think that I, I wanted to give a full breakdown, as I always do to our fans out there, of it wasn't just he threw a punch. He, he threw a punch at a certain time and a certain way and obviously it had a devastating effect on on Strickland. Yeah, and by the way, um, Pereira had, in 2016, won a unanimous decision in kickbox against Izzy, a, a decision that Adesanya disputes. And in the 2017 rematch, 
Izzy had Pereira hurt right before he got knocked out himself. So interesting uh, subplots for this potential next matchup. And I believe Dana said this is the next fight if they both win. So that is something interesting to look forward to to Izzy because he's basically cleaning out the division. I don't know if Pereira can't get him. I don't know what's next for him unless he gets back on the um, light heavyweight kick again and tries to move up, which I think you can eventually do. I think he, Jan, uh, Jan Blachowicz was the wrong matchup for him when he fought him. But... You know, maybe Yuri uh, Prohaf, Prohakit, Prohachik, whatever his name is, uh, maybe that's a better matchup. But anyway, interesting. Um, and with not, that, wait, wait, real quick, I'll comment on that. I don't think so. That Prohachik is a monster. He, he's, a, he, he's a ton. He, he's a horse. He, he, he's something to deal with. He's athletic. Obviously, Izzy is more athletic than everyone he faces for the most part. This guy's bigger and athletic. Uh, and he has a difficult style, just like Izzy does. Um, Provacic has a very difficult style. He's explosive. He's big. Uh, he's very tough, as he as he showed in that unbelievable war with Texera. Unbelievable how he survived that, how he came back, and how Texera survived what he's of. That was epic. That was an. If you people haven't seen that fight, go watch it. That that was tremendous. But uh. I don't think too many people want to get a piece of uh, Pro Hemchik uh, too fast, too fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this next fight with Izzy and Pereira. Uh, but let's let's talk uh, two friends of the show, two guys we both really like, Alex Volkanovsky and Max Holloway. They've both been guests on the show. If you haven't seen any of the, in those interviews, please go back and check them out. But uh, coming into this one, my friend Ben Anderson, the war correspondent from Vice, he texted me and said, uh, Holloway's like a pretty big underdog on this one. And I said, uh, and he said, the last one, he could have easily been the winner. And I said, I was just talking. I said, you know what? Maybe I think that they think is the case is that Volk looks like he keeps getting better. And Holloway, not that he's not getting better, but maybe he's kind of peaked. And I think that Volk, after the battle he had with Brian Ortega and being so close, maybe his confidence is rising and he's getting better. And I think that that might be what happened. So I said, gun to my head, I'm taking Volk. I think he's going to win. And it literally, that's exactly what I saw play out in the fight is that Volkanovsky came in with a, with a sense of confidence and skill that just seemed to like, he kind of he kind of leveled up and Holloway was the same he's been. And I'm curious to know if you think, again, if Holloway, like with the with the rodriguez Sering Vise fight, do you think that Holloway got old overnight or do you think Volkanovski's just leveled up to a level where he's just pulling away from the competition? I think that's a fair observation that uh, to notice beforehand and then obviously afterhand that Volkanovski keeps getting better. So that that we we'll start with that. But no, I don't think that's what was at play here. Uh, this is what I think was at play for the most part. Again, seventy five percent of fight business is mental, and I think there was a there was a dimension of that again where Holloway, I thought he won the second fight with Volk. I love both guys. They, they are everything that this game stands for. They, they behave. We know that they fight like warriors. Uh, expertise that they have. They know how to fight like top, top, top fighters. But they also know how to behave like warriors, like gladiators. They have a code of conduct. And that code of conduct is matched outside the ring in their behavior as it is in the ring or in the cage, I should say. Um, so for that, I, I have nothing but the ultimate amount of respect for and admiration for both guys. And I thank them for what they represent, for what they teach us, what they show us. And I thank Holloway wherever he goes in his career the rest of the way, rest of the way, for everything that he's given us and taught us. And having said that, I think that they're all proud, proud guys, and they get influenced by things. And in the last fight, which was close, the second fight, as you said, Volkanovski was 2-0 and going into this third matchup. I thought he Holloway won. 
And I think that he felt that pressure. He's winding down in his career. And I thought that he felt that pressure where this is my last shot at it, possibly, which he, it might very well be, uh, at the title again. And I got to do, I got to push the envelope. I got to come outside of myself a little of what I normally do, what my normal approach is. And I got to do a little more. I got to take more chances. I got. It, it's not enough just to do, obviously, what I did last time, what I normally do which is to box, which is to be one of the best strikers uh, in the business. The best striker right now might be Volkanovski, but I'll get more to that. Uh, I'll color that in, if you will, uh, in a minute. But Holloway was one of the best strikers in in all MMA. His jab, his ability to use his legs, to control the outside of the cage, um, to set up combinations. He had a great... You remember that performance he put on against Calvin Cater? Yeah, Oof. incredible. And Cater's good. Good good yeah. striker and good puncher. Uh, he, I mean, extraordinary. Extraordinary striker, boxer. Uh, he looks like he could be a boxer, I mean, sometimes, when he performed the way he performed and, and could perform. And he had that long reach, that long jab. Volkanovski is shorter. Um, so you figured that he was going to apply those skills and that mentality uh, because that's, that's him at his best. He didn't. He gave it all up. And some of it had to do with Volkanovski. But, but bear with me. He, gave, he basically threw it out the window <laughs> and he became just a sick and destroy guy. That's not Holloway. That hasn't been the great Holloway. He just, he just came forward, walked in, and and looked to just outgun Volkanovski. While Volkanovski, well, he put on an exhibition of boxing that was just superlative. I mean, he he gave an exhibition of what the sweet science is all about, from every dimension, from using his legs, pot shotting on the outside, getting angles, counter punching, going forward. He closed the gap so fast in spots. He reminded me of a younger Pacquiao where he could just close the gap and not get caught <laughs> as he closed the gap. Then he went back to boxing. And he did what I used to say on ESPN when I was trying to explain and teach the viewers where there's two ways to deal with a taller guy. One is obviously go get him. Move your head like Tyson did. Use your jab. Move your feet forward and close the gap. The other way is the opposite. A lot of people don't know that way. To convince, if you will, to, to get your opponent to give up his height, to step back and entice your opponent to come in and then when he comes in, you counter punch him. You slip the punch, you counter. And now you got him not using his greatest physical asset, which is height and reach. Now you got him giving that up and coming sort of like the spider bringing a beetle into his web where you got him fighting your fight. That's what he did. He, being Volkanovski, basically got, again, it might have been from what I said that in his own mind, but whatever it was, he got Holloway to fight his fight, to do exactly what he wanted him to do. And and he did. And he kind of took him apart. Uh, he just took advantage of that. Volkanovski was the ultimate professional boxer where he was calm, he was together, he was consistent all night. He stayed to his game plan. And I also think that I felt bad for Holloway towards the end. I'll tell you why. It was, just, it was a shutout. And again, I could use the analogy of a pitcher, great pitcher, you know, doing it all, taking a bat from a great, you know, from a great batter out of his hands and disarming him, neutralizing him, you know, uh, where, where he just kept him off balance, mixed up the pitches all night, and, and he pitched a shutout. It was. It was 5 nothing. I felt sorry. I, again, I have nothing but love and admiration for both guys. But... I felt sorry for Holloway, and I bet you there's fans out there were feeling something towards this, that where with his career and everything, I almost felt the desperation 
of he knew this was his last shot probably at at the you know at the title and that desperation that urgency i think it got in the way of his clear thinking that he normally brings to the ring as one of his weapons one of his assets that's his, a good observation yeah i i really do ken i think it it played i think it was a part of it i think it played out either way though all the credit in the world he's the best striker in the game right now i mean he's a little guy he's a little mighty mite and we know how great he is on the floor and we know he's a zombie that that you, <laughs> you can't kill him you can't he kill won't him. tap he, he won't tap he won't tap he, he he he's not human and we know that um and but Holloway is just as tough. Holloway in his own right is just as tough. But it was that example that I've used before in his end. I use it again. Why? Because it's appropriate. It fits. Where Customato, the great Customato, my mentor, used to say to me, Teddy, when you get two tough guys, and that they were two tough guys, in the ring, and one is smarter, one is using his mind more. One is using his technique, developed technique, better. He automatically becomes twice as tough in that kind of way. And it becomes a no contest. Like Salvador, Salvador Sanchez, the great, great Salvador Sanchez, and the great Indian Red Lopez, one of my favorite fighters of all time back in the 70s, the early 80s, where Indian Red Lopez, little Danny Ro Lopez, he, he was... He was beating everybody for years as the featherweight champ with that right hand, with that chin of granite, with that toughness, come forward style. He broke everyone down. But then he fought Sanchez, who was tough and smart. And it was no contest. And that's what this was, that Volkanovski made it no contest just by being smarter in that kind of way. And, and at the end of the day, again, uh, just kudos to both men for the way that they conduct themselves, always have, always will, because it's them inside the cage and outside the cage. Uh, so that's that's also, how, that's how I saw uh, it. Also, kudos to uh, Holloway's cut, man. That cut on his eyebrow was vicious. I mean, that, that was that deep. didn't help. That was that, that, that was meaty. That didn't help, but but it, but I think that. The die was already cast. You know what I mean? That yeah, he yep. already he was he was locked into this style. He was locked yep. into this attitude, to this mindset that that's what he was going to go do and had to yep. do. Um, but that didn't help. That was that was nasty. Bad one. Uh, breaking news. This just in, Teddy. Joey Chestnuts defends the title, gobbles down 63 dogs and buns in 10 minutes. Far cry from his record of 76 dogs and buns, which is what he did last year. Which I, was I gave an erroneous uh, number at the beginning of the podcast. I said 68 was record. So 76? <laughs> wow. Holy. In 10 minutes. Wow, he must have took this on short notice. <laughs> he, he must he, he must have uh, stopped at a barbecue on the way. You know what yeah, I mean? He pulled, he pulled the De La Hoya. He thought he was ahead in the last rounds and just like skated. And uh, That's just a good e point. Like out. he did with Trinidad. Like <laughs> exactly. he did with Trinidad. You're right. Yeah, he might have done that. Exactly. Uh, all right, let's get into the main event here. Um, you said it earlier in the fight. Uh Big fan of both guys, but this fight was not uh, as exciting or, or all it was uh, billed to be. It was a strategic, I hesitate to say almost boring affair at times, but Diz, Izzy did what he had to do. He almost pitched the shutout. One guy gave, one of the judges gave him a shutout. The other two had him, uh, gave one round to Cannoneer, and uh, Izzy gets the win, keeps, keeps the title. Um, how'd you like that one? Yeah, you hit it right. I mean, listen, we tell the truth, and the truth is there to tell itself. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't exciting, but I will say that not exciting, but efficient, efficient performance by Izzy by Adesanya, um, because he did what he had to do, and he got it done. Um, kind of, kind of near, I. I expected him, you know, he's a bigger guy, he's a 
broader guy. He's a thicker guy, strong guy. We understand that he's, he's one of the best strikers in the business. And he's very athletic, very light-footed, very quick with his hands. Like a young Roy Jones, he does things different. You know, a, a difficult style, unorthodox, can can create it as he's doing it, make it up as he's doing it, uh, and come at you with all kinds of things. He can improvise really well. I, I thought that Kananir would, and I think a lot of the experts out there in, in the MMA field thought he might look to take him to the mat or might have to take him to the mat, you know, like Blahovich did when he beat Adesanya. Now, difference, I get it. Blahovich was much bigger. Adesanya took the chance, which great fighters do, um, and went up to light heavyweight to challenge Blahovich, and Blahovich did what he had to do. He took him to the mat and used his physical strength and his abilities on the mat, uh, you know, to, to get the decision. Uh, b but I thought that he would follow that playbook a little bit, kind of near, you know, again, not being as big as Blahovic, but still, where he tried to get him to the mat. Now, Adesanya's developed a real good escape system, a defense to getting taken down. He's really good. He's worked at that. Not just his striking. He's worked on the mat. He's worked on, again, his ability to, you know, his escape ability, like a great quarterback in the NFL, John Elway, or, um, you know, who's the great one now with the uh, Cardinals? Boy, he's good. Uh, he came out of Oklahoma. Uh, 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 Kyle. Uh, yeah, that's him. Uh, Kyle, yeah. What the hell is his name? Um, I'll think of it. Yeah, yeah. He, um, uh, He's tremendous. But, uh, I mean, he's like a quarterback that knows how to escape from the pocket. Uh, when you think you have him. And so Izzy's made it difficult for Kanane maybe to complete his task. If that Kyler was, Murray. Yeah, that's him. If if he wanted that to be his task. But I thought that should have been part of his task. Um, I also, I thought Kanane could have used the jab more. I know Izzy's got the advantage. He's longer. He controls the outside. He did what he had to do. But I thought that Kanane maybe like Tyson used to do, Mike Tyson, slip, take away the reach, and then, you know, throw your jab. And even if if I was in the corner of Cananeo in camp, I would have said, look, you got to use your jab, even if it's to the chest of Adesanya, just, just to keep him honest, so he don't dominate you on the outside with the jab, just to keep him honest, and to stabilize him on the outside, even if you're not going to be catching him, but just stabilize him. Do, it still does its job. It doesn't have to land and jolt his head back to do its job. Um, so I thought that was missing. I thought another place where Kananir missed the boat a little bit, Ken, was sometimes you can flush. <laughs> Izzy's got great legs and great sense of timing and you know instincts uh, and, and reflexes. But sometimes you can, you can flush him out of the pocket. You can get him to go straight back. And if you go with him, you might, you know, you might, you might get fortunate. You might catch him with some if you punch with him as he goes back. And I thought Kananir could have done that. Force him out of the pocket and then try to catch him falling back straight with his hands low. And he did once, but he didn't do it any other fight. And, and it worked, but he didn't follow up. He didn't do it any other times. Again, not a scintillating fight. You could say boring, uh, but also tactical and also efficient. Uh, you know, obviously by by Adesanya, you know, playing to his strength, keeping a fight where, you know, away from the strengths of Kananir, uh, and and playing to the strengths of himself. There was one round, I think it was the second round, but um, uh, there was a round where Kananir changed the geography of the fight, and he got inside. He didn't get him to the mat, but he got inside more. And by changing the geography enough in that round, whatever round that was, I felt that Kananir got that round, was was able to get that round, and was able to keep the fight within striking distance, you know, stay within the fight. In other words, keep the fight closer than maybe some people would have thought. And I thought he was able to do that. Now, part of it was by making it a boring fight. What do I mean by that? He didn't get reckless, you know, Ken, because a lot of guys feel the pressure. They got to get to Izzy and they get reckless and they walk into a counter and they get put to sleep. So 
by being patient, by being cautious, by being careful, whatever way you want to describe it, Kananir kept himself in the fight, extended the fight, and didn't do anything stupid, right, if you will. Didn't do anything silly and, and just walk into something where, where by being contained, he had made a boring fight, but it also gave him a chance to be in a fight. So I thought all of that, uh, to Kadania's credit, uh, if you want to give him credit, I, I I thought all of that was was taking place, um, and and at the end of the day, I I thought that also that when you fight Izzy, you know I used the analogy earlier of a quarterback in NFL. I'm going to flip back to that. When you fight him, his striking ability is very good. And and his creativity is 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 very good. What he could do out there if you let him, uh, kind of like with a great quarterback like Tom Brady, your guy, or he used to be your guy. You you threw him out of your Rolodex. <laughs> you removed him from your Rolodex when he left when he left that uh, New England area. But part of the the plan with these great quarterbacks, you know, obviously Mahomes is a great example from Kansas City. He might be the best example right now. To beat them, you want to keep him on the bench so he can't do damage. And I look at Izzy, fighting Izzy, if I was the trainer, the same way. You want to keep him on the bench. Now, how do you keep him on the bench where he's not out there doing damage? Well, you get your hands on him. You close the gaps. You, if you can't take him to the mat, you get him up against the fence, up against you know the, the cage, and... And you keep him from being on the field of play in a way that he wants to be, where he can show that great athleticism and he can put forth those great skills uh, when he's on the field, if you will. So, I, 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 again, you got to do more of that. Kyle Nier did it in one round, but he didn't do it. I, I I say it. I, he didn't take the chance, maybe, to do it to get where he needed to get. Maybe he was worried about getting counted. I get it, but he needed to do that more if he was really gonna probably at the end do more than survive to five, but actually win the five. Um, so at the end of the day, I probably the way a lot of the fans are, and you are right now. I'm looking forward to him fighting uh, Pereira. Uh, I I really am. I think it's a great matchup uh, because one of the reasons it's great is that the psychological part. <laughs> and Izzy's very strong <laughs> psychologically, and he's going to have to be. But Pereira already has a win over him, so he, he might have the edge there, maybe, psychologically. He's already beaten him, and he's knocked him out, and he's beaten him twice. So he might have that little edge, that psych which is so important, the mental part. So he might have that. So it's a different is he he's he's old, he's more mature. Now it's in the octagon. It's not with kickboxing, it's not with the gloves. Yeah, you know, it's different. But I still I think it's very interesting because of what Pereira brings to the equation with the edge mentally, maybe, maybe, but also with his long arms. Because Izzy has those long arms and he controls geography very well to his liking on the outside when he wants to and sets up counters, you know, creates creates moments where his opponent will make mistakes sometimes and lunge a little bit to get to him where he can fill the hole with his fast hands. Pereira has the length of arms, the long arms, to match him in that area, to... to to in some ways, you know, take away that advantage from Izzy, where his arms are long too, and where he can negate some of that advantage that Izzy usually has in that dimension, in that domain. So for all those reasons, um, I I look forward to that fight. I I really look forward, and and like like you said, it seems like Dana already said, yeah, it's going to happen. So uh, that's one I would mark on the calendar. Yeah, for sure. Well, Teddy, it's the 4th of July. I know you've got fireworks to set off and children to entertain and hot dogs to eat. Don't eat 63, whatever you do. 
two I'm not, three I'm, not, I'm not going to even eat 53. Um, <laughs> but you know, I am going to say, as I did at the top, and I'll say it again at the finish, um, happy 4th of July to everybody. Enjoy this great country and everything that it offers you. Um, and uh, have a safe time out there with the fireworks. Be careful. You know, uh, we do hear those terrible stories with the accidents with the fireworks. So please, you know, please be careful, uh, obviously, out there. And please, if uh, listen, we appreciate you. Uh, if you appreciate uh, Ken giving up his extravagant barbecue today and, and, and uh, you know, he doesn't have hamburgers. He, you know, he has some um, Colby steaks. But listen, <laughs> it's, it's the same idea. It's the same idea, right? It's on a barbecue. Yep. But same spirit. Uh, same spirit, exactly. If you appreciate us, him giving that up, then subscribe. Just, just subscribe and keep doing what you're doing, being there with us. We enjoy you. We hope you enjoy us. And uh, God bless. Have a great week, everyone, and thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week.